Hi, Rick here, and welcome to Digital Fortress. In today's video, I'm going to show you attack-resistant methods of installing the Daedalus Wallet. There's going to be two separate videos. The first video is going to be for basic installation for most users. It's the type of video you can use to install Daedalus with attack resistance without having to have advanced expert knowledge. You'll be able to follow the video step-by-step, step, basically, to get the installation done. The other video is going to be for experts. You're going to have to have more advanced knowledge of how firewalls work and antivirus systems work to be able to do the more advanced version of it, but it's going to give you the greatest amount of attack protection. The video for advanced users is more so for people who are going to be setting up stake pools using a home server, for example, as opposed to clustered servers out there on the internet or do a cluster service. It would be for People who, have, who want extra layers of protection are willing to go the extra mile to put a couple more layers of security on their installation process. So whichever method you choose, either the attack resistant installation method or the highly attack resistant method, there is always some level of risk. Hackers are very clever. They can get through anything. That's why none of these methods are guarantees. If you learn other techniques about how to use greater levels of security, please ensure you use those. One thing that you want to ensure that you do for either method is that you have an antivirus scanner installed, it's up to date, and that you've run it to ensure that you have no viruses on your computer or as best as possible you don't have viruses on your computer. And the other thing is don't use public Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi is very vulnerable to attack. Ensure that you're on a private network and using wired internet if possible. I prefer to use Ethernet connection because even a private Wi-Fi has some vulnerabilities involved. In this video, we're going to talk about the firewall setup concept, updating virus scanners, running the updated antivirus, verifying firewall operation, verifying antivirus operation. Step six there is our last external step, connecting with Ethernet device Wi-Fi. Earlier, I recommended don't use public Wi-Fi. And in this case, we're not going to use private Wi-Fi. We're actually going to connect via Ether in case the private Wi-Fi is compromised. Then step seven, that one's listed in green. That's where we're actually going to start the procedures internal to the process of installing Cardano Daedalus. We're going to download GPG Suite, verify the Shaysum, then install GPG. Verifying the Shaysum helps verify we have the correct file, but it will come from the same website as the GPG Suite software. In step 10, we're going to download Daedalus from daedaluswallet.io, verify the install file Shaysum from that same website. Then we're going to download the signature from a different website. We're going to go get it from GitHub to increase our level of security because it's harder to compromise two different websites. Then step 13, we're going to verify the Daedalus signature using the GitHub downloaded signature file. Let's talk about the types of firewalls we'll be using. In this list, I have some examples. I've got the Cisco, a Fortinet, and a Zixel, and there's many others. These are not your standard household router, Wi-Fi, firewalls. These are more like the business entry-level models. You really need to know what you're doing when you set up these models, or you should have it set up by a professional so that they're configured correctly. It's not like your typical home basic Wi-Fi router. These ones are going to require advanced command line configurations or using a web browser to configure the incoming and outgoing firewall rules. I'm not endorsing these particular products. These are just examples of pretty good firewalls. The basic idea is we're not going to use an ISP provided Wi-Fi switch or router. I'll give you an example. I once used an ISP provided Wi-Fi switch router. And when I went to go on my online account, I was looking at my account information and I saw that there was an option to set or change your password and it was all blotted out so that someone wouldn't be able to see it. But I was on an external web page and it had the check block with the option to show password. So I checked it on and it displayed my password in plain text from an external website for an internal Wi-Fi switch router that was being used in my house. And when I saw that, I thought, nope, can't have that. That's definitely a security problem. So that's why we're not going to use ISP provided. Step two through eight are recommendations. Step two says enable unified threat management if the router has that. Unified threat management usually has an extra cost associated with it. The routers I showed you on the previous slide, those are typically about, they're about $500 range routers. And if the router has UTM, UTM typically requires an annual subscription in the range of $100 to maybe $150. 
approximately, depending on the service provider you get. Uh, step three, enable certificate inspection. That's part of the setup that you would do on your router. The routers handle it differently, depending if you got the Cisco, the Zixel, or the Fortinet. Also enabling intrusion prevention, enabling virus scanning at the, out there at the firewall edge. Enabling DNS rules in case uh, you have, there, there are websites out there when they try to do an attack, they spoof the website. And if you set DNS rules that say do not allow new domain names either through the search engine or through the firewall, it will block going to a brand new URL within a specified range of time. Say if it's within 30 days or 60 days old, it won't go to new URLs. That's how a lot of attackers will do it is they'll spoof a website using a similar name. We've got step seven there, enabling deep packet inspection, if you have the type of router that will allow that. And step eight, enable rules for both inbound and outbound traffic, especially if you're running a web server out of your home and your business, or you're running miners or, or something like that that has to have traffic come from inside your firewall, outbound. we got to make sure we're scanning traffic both ways. That works pretty good for inbound traffic coming from outside the firewall. But once the information starts passing through, you want a lot more thorough inspection if you want the higher levels of security. So I talked about the firewall setup concept and antivirus. Let's take a look practically on my computer. I have a few things set up as an example of what you can do or look for when you're preparing to do the installation. The things that you want to make sure the groundwork is laid before you download the file. Okay, so here my Wi-Fi is turned off and connected by Ethernet cable because uh, even a private Wi-Fi router can be subjected to compromise. I've got my virus scanner. I'm using Kaspersky. Kaspersky show me all green checks. A lot of the other antivirus scanners do this too. Norton, Zone Alarm, all those are very good. Computers protected and I've performed scans that come up clean. So this shows my antivirus operation is pretty much good to go and I also recently updated databases. So my antivirus scanner is up to date and I have several layers of protection turned on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Bing or Google. puts these little green shields where links are showing. I'm going to conduct a search. And I get these little green shields showing links that are safe. And it will show a red shield for links that are known to be unsafe. They're blacklisted somewhere. Or if there's no shield at all, it's unknown. I have seen a red shield before. It's when I had my firewall settings turned down, but with the firewall settings turned up, most likely a bad link won't get through, but it's a good idea to have uh, multiple layers of security in place. Next, I'm gonna to go to a website called icar.org to test both my firewall and my virus scanner. And I'm gonna to go to anti-malware test file download. These files here are not real viruses, but they're test viruses that are used to test virus scanners and stuff like that. So I'm going to try to download this one and it gets blocked by the firewall. So it never even gets inside the home network on the computer side. So any of these that are using the standard HTTP protocol are going to get caught by the firewall, even a zip file. But whenever you use the SSL enabled HTTPS protocols and you try to download it, it's going to come through the firewall encrypted, but it got caught by Kaspersky over here. Bam. So that's why it's a good idea. It's a good idea to have a firewall scanning for viruses and an internal scanner for viruses for things to get through the firewall that get caught by your antivirus scanner. And I'm going to pause a moment here to make sure that those files were deleted and clean up. We'll be right back. So we have multiple zones protection. We have protection at the firewall itself at the point of entry from the ISP in your house. We've got protection at the endpoint at the computer itself. So there's another layer of protection. And we also have protection out there on the internet by having the scanning processes. There's blacklists inside the virus scanners itself or inside the internet security suites that you have out there. And there's also uh, at Google and Bing and other the major web service providers, they're also scanning for malicious content. The next thing we're going to look at is software firewall. Over here I have one called Little Snitch. 
little snitch scans traffic coming in and out. I cleared all the traffic and I set the operating mode to silent mode, deny connections, so that any new connection that's created will require approval before that connection is allowed to be completed. So there's kind of three firewalls operating. There's the hardware firewall out at the modem, the cable modem going out to my ISP. There's a little snitch here, and there's also the Mac firewall under system preferences. That's turned on as well. And there's multiple virus scanners, probably a little bit of overkill, but you can never be too sure because I've had some virus scanners catch viruses where others don't and have some parts of the firewall catch things coming through where other parts of firewalls don't. So there's multiple layers of security and redundant protection there. So that takes care of steps one through six. Now we're going to get on to steps seven through 14. We'll we actually go through the installation process. Let's take a look at the next slide that will summarize the steps. So the steps we're about to perform is one through 11 shown here, written out word for word. Step 12, we're actually gonna have to follow the video to perform that one, unless you already know how. On to the procedure. For this procedure, we're gonna use three websites, datalistwallet.io, GitHub, and gpgtools.org. We're gonna start at datalistwallet.io and check the verify signature procedure here, where it says step one, obtain the Daedalus installer package file and its corresponding package.asc signature file. We're gonna get the package from here, we're gonna get the ASC file from GitHub because it's a lot harder to compromise two different websites than just hack one. So that gives us an increased level of security by getting the signature from another website. The Daedalus download is complete. What I'm going to do now is verify the integrity of the download of this Daedalus installer right here. But instead of using the SHA-256 checksum from here, I'm going to use the SHA-256 checksum from the GitHub web page. Now, apparently they're going to be the same, so let's go take a look. We've got to scroll down. Let's go back to GitHub. And here it is. I'm going to copy it. Now I'm going to launch a terminal by pressing command spacebar. It opens up the searchlight. I type in the word terminal, hit enter, and it launches the terminal. Inside the terminal, I'm going to change directories to downloads and when I start typing download, I hit tab complete. It'll finish typing it for me as long as it's unique. And I hit enter or return. Now I'm going to type Shea Sumtac A 256. And I begin typing dead list the same as it shows here in downloads. And tab complete. And I hit enter. It runs some math and generates a unique number. I'm going to hit Command V to paste the number I copied from GitHub, and I see that it's a match. Now we know this binary is a valid download. Let's continue. Now instead of getting the signature from here, I'm going to go to GitHub and download the signature from here. Now that both downloads are complete, and they're both in the downloads directory. I go back to deadlistwallet.io, verify signature, and it says go to gpgtools.org. Download GPG Suite, and that download's complete. Now I'm going to verify that download that the binary is intact by pressing Command Space Bar to launch the Spotlight Search. Type in Terminal. Type change directory downloads and I start typing. I'm going to hit tab complete. Then Shea Sumtac A 256. GPG Suite 2018 and hit enter. 
verified that the shade 256 number matches. And it's a match. You have a good binary. Close the terminal and back to the procedure. Now we're going to open and install the GPG Suite installer. Now we're on the last part of step three, follow through with the installation wizard. Now we're on step four. I'm gonna reorganize the window so we can see better. The key was created successfully. Now we're ready for step five. Import the IOHK key using the GPG keychain application. Select key, look up key on key server in the application menu. I can also do the step from here. So I'm going to copy and paste signing authority at IOHK.io. And it's been found. The next part of step five says choose the key with fingerprint Charlie Bravo Foxtrot Alpha Alpha 9 Bravo Alpha with user ID. That's this one here. Retrieve key. Import successful. And the next part of step five says verify, right click the imported key, then details. and the fingerprint is a match. Now we proceed with the next step. Step six is sign the imported IOHK key. This designates trust is required for the next step. Right click on the imported IOHK key, then sign. Signing successful. Now let's clean up our windows and perform step seven. This is where we actually verify the installer binary using the signature that we downloaded from GitHub compared to the binary that we downloaded from dailyswallet.io. So two different files from two different websites. Let's see if we get a match. Launch Finder. And in Finder, we're going to right-click the Daedalus installer.pkg file. Do not right-click on the ASC file. That will not work. The ASC file is what it's going to be compared to when we use this PKG file. Right-click, Services, Open PGP, Verify Signature of File. Here are the verification results. This is what we're looking for. It is signed by IOHK Signing Authority, and it's marked in green and full trust. So we created our own signature in the GPG suite. We verified that GPG suite binary. We downloaded Daedalus. We downloaded Daedalus package.asc file from a separate website. Then we verified the signature with GPG suite. We are now ready to install Daedalus, so let's do the installation.
Now we launch Daedalus. Speed reading is a must for software installers. Installation started at 8.15 p.m. So while Daedalus is installing, let's go back to the GPG suite. See what's going on with this red validity bar over here. Let's do another key lookup using this time, and we did our first one when you signing it on authority.hk.io. Now we'll take a look for team at gpgtools.org using the same procedure. Let's do lookup key. There's their key. Retrieve. Import successful. We see this new key is from 6.13.18, much more recent. The original installation was 8.19.10. That's a pretty old key. And now that this tool's installed, let's go back to the web page. Download the GPG signature. Now I'm going to sign it. And it's green. Alright, so now that this is green, I gotta go back and get that other key that I took out earlier. So I'm gonna do uh, look up key. I can do it from this menu up here, or I can select it from here. Search, and I'm going to import that one that I unchecked earlier. So hit retrieve key. That was red earlier. Let's see what happens. Oh, it showed up as yellow. Import successful. I gotta sign it. Okay, so I got it green there. Now I should be able to verify the signature in my downloads. The same way we verified the signature on Daedalus, we have GPG Suite installed, so I should be able to go here, right click, services, verify signature of file, and it comes up full trust. So we're good to go there. This is like quadruple verified. We verified the binary of GPG Suite, verified the binary of Daedalus, verified the signature of GPG Suite, and verified the signature of Daedalus. Extra verification there. Although I got the signature of GPG Suite from their own website. Let's go back to Daedalus, see how the install's going. 56% and it's 9.05 p.m. And one last little bit of housekeeping here. I'm going to get rid of this key. Because uh, this is bogus name, email address, and actually everything you see on the screen is going to be deleted when I'm done with this video. Even the Daedalus wallet, the account, everything. Uh, so just a little bit of cleanup here. And Daedalus block synchronization is complete. 10.22 p.m. That took two hours and seven minutes. This wasn't a benchmark. I got the firewall on full throttle. So now that the block is synced, I can create a new wallet. SpongeBob, and our password. Follow these directions closely for security. It's going to be the 12 word phrase. Please make sure nobody looks onto your screen unless you want them to have access to your funds. And this is also where if you have a virus that does screen recording, this would capture it, but we ran the virus scanning earlier. And we write down these phrases. 
Now as a security practice, you would never show these phrases on your screen like I'm showing now. I'm going to be deleting this wallet and the account and everything that you see on the screen right now is going to be all deleted. But, you know, someone can look at this video and recreate this wallet, and there might be a couple of people do that. So please make sure you do not send any funds to any wallet that I create on these YouTube videos, because I'm going to delete it, but other people can replicate it and uh, play around with it. So be careful of that. And the method they use here prevents an attack from the keystroke logger malware, because we're going to click on each word to put it back in. So here's my recovery phrase and have it written down. Hit yes, I have it written down. Now I tap each word in the correct order. That keeps you from having to press the keys. And when you select the last word and it's correct, the screen will change. I understand my wallet and tokens are held securely on this device only and not on any servers. And the statement for you understand that the application is moved to another device. And there's our wallet. Installation complete. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching Digital Fortress. If you would like to leave me comments down below, please feel free to do so. You can reach me on Telegram and Twitter as well using my username Rick McCracken. Feel free to select like, subscribe, and if you want notifications, use the bell. Thanks, and have a great day. Bye-bye.